Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad you like that. Those words mean a great deal to us, and you'll see that reflected throughout the show today. Welcome to the Worldwide Developers Conference. You're going to have an incredible week. This is our 24th WWDC. It's the longest running developer conference that we're aware of. It's truly worldwide. We have attendees this morning for over 60 countries. And two thirds of the people in the audience today are here for the first time. No hazing from the upperclassmen. We've got a great week planned for you with over 100 sessions and over 120 hands-on labs so you can bring in your code, get some help tuning it, or get just about any question answered. We also have over 1,000 engineers here this week, so grab them, make use of them, they're here to help. But don't ask them about future roadmaps. <laughs> now, the developer program is incredibly vibrant. We have over 6 million registered developers with one and a half million of those added in the last year alone. Demand for this show has never been greater. We sold out in just over a minute. I'm really sorry we couldn't accommodate everyone. It's the biggest venue that we can get. But we are posting sessions online every day so that developers can follow us remotely. I'd like to get started this morning with a few updates, beginning with Apple Retail. Of course, our retail stores are the best place to discover and explore our products. And over a million people per day did that last year. This is phenomenal. Our stores are filled with our colleagues who work at our stores because they're passionate about how Apple technology can enrich people's lives. Our stores have become integral parts of the communities that they serve. Tens of thousands of school kids pick their local Apple store as the destination for their annual field trip. And millions of customers come to our stores for personal training so that they can learn to get the most out of their Apple products. We now have 407 stores around the world. We're operating in 14 countries. And we've recently opened this beautiful store in Berlin. It is really awesome. It's in a 100-year-old building. It was originally one of the first theaters in Berlin. We painstakingly honored the history of the building by restoring the facade and the original theater and added some classic Apple touches along the way. The theater is integral to the building, but separate from the store, and we'll be hosting many events throughout the year for the communities from music to films and more. We had our signature crowds at the opening, and we were so excited about this opening, we made a video, and I'd like to run it for you this morning.
That's Berlin. It's a fantastic store in a great location. Only Apple could do this. Now, we also have some pretty great digital stores. And I know this is incredibly important to those of you in the audience. The App Store celebrates its fifth birthday next month. Nothing like the App Store existed before, and it has fundamentally changed the world. Customers love the buying experience, and they love your incredible apps, and they've now downloaded 50 billion apps. This is phenomenal. That's a lot of zeros and a truly staggering number for less than five years. Thanks to you, we now have 900,000 apps in the store, and the catalog is very active. 90% of those are downloaded each month. We have 375,000 apps that have been designed for iPad to take advantage of the full, beautiful canvas that still compares to just a few hundred from those other guys. And we have 575 million accounts. These are, most of these accounts have credit cards and one-click buying, so it's simple and elegant to buy your apps. We have more accounts with credit cards than any store on the internet that we're aware of. Now, we are incredibly proud this morning to announce that we have now paid developers $10 billion. And the momentum is incredible. We paid out $5 billion of that just in the last year. Now, to put that in context, that's three times more than all other platforms combined. One of the things we love about the App Store is that it levels the playing field between large developers and small developers. Ron Conway said it very nicely. The App Store and the iOS ecosystem give budding developers with great ideas the best chance for success. This morning, I'd like to introduce you to Anki. Anki is using the iOS platform to create an entirely new category of experiences. They're launching their company for the first time on stage today. They're using iOS devices and the iOS platform to bring artificial intelligence and robotics into our daily lives. I'd like to introduce Boris Softman, CEO and co-founder of Anki, to tell us about his company and their very first new product. Boris? Thank you, Tom. We started Anki while working on our PhDs in robotics at Carnegie Mellon University, where we worked on everything from machine learning to walk-in robots to autonomous vehicles. With the help of iOS devices, we are bringing these robotics and artificial intelligence technologies out of the lab and into people's lives. And we're starting by reinventing the way people play. Today, after over half a decade of working on Anki, we are so excited to give you a peek at our first product, Anki Drive. Assisting me today is Brad Newman, our lead AI engineer at Anki. Now, we're gonna start by sharing some of the technology under the hood. As we have these cars go through a few formations, realize that each of them is completely driving themselves, and our app is coordinating the entire experience over Bluetooth Low Energy. The cars can control their speed, and they steer around the track by doing the same computations your brain does when you drive. They sense where they're located, and they react to their surroundings, all in real time. This red car, he's our hero, Aiden. We designed him and all the other cars to be incredibly smart. 500 times per second, they're running logic to sense the track, their position on it, adjusting their steering and speed, and communicating back and forth with our AI engine on that iPhone. Now I'll let Aiden join his friends and tell him to hit the gas. Watch this. There we go. All right. So, 
As Aiden weaves through the pack, our app knows everything that's happening in real time. It's analyzing thousands of potential actions every single second. And not just for Aiden, but for every single car. We are using iOS devices not just as remote controls, but as the brains behind an immersive, real-world experience. And that is what lets us bring these cars to life. Now let's do something interesting here. Brad, he's going to tell these other cars to try to block Aiden. And just to be clear, none of this is choreographed. All we're doing is defining a new objective for each car, and they figure out the rest. Here, Aiden, he's using the exact same logic he was using before, sensing where he is and reacting to the other cars as he looks for an opening. Except now, these other guys are on a mission to try to block him. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> Luckily, Aiden is equipped to handle any situation. Weapons enabled. <laughs> this is a video. <laughs> this is a video game in the real world. We can customize everything in software from the characteristics of the vehicles to the weapons that they can use. We are taking all of the things we love about video games and programming them onto physical characters that you can actually touch. With Anki Drive, we use this technology to take gaming to a whole new level. And the real fun starts when you take control of these cars yourselves. With your iPhone or iPod Touch, you can play against your friends, or you can challenge, uh, take your chances against the AI. We are bringing video games to life on the floor of your living room. Keep your eyes out for Anki Drive coming to Apple stores and Apple online this fall. And we just pushed the Anki Drive app today so you can download it and get a deeper look. We are a robotics and artificial intelligence company and what you see here is only the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's incredibly fun. I think these guys are gonna be super successful. I think it's a great example of the power of the combination of your incredible apps and the iOS devices in the ecosystem. I'd love to show you a lot more today, but we don't have time. But I'd like to thank, on behalf of Apple, I'd like to thank all of the developers here for making such incredible apps. Thank you. Next, I'd like to talk about the Mac. The Mac install base now is incredibly strong at 72 million. This is double what it was just five years ago. We announced the new iMac at the end of last year, and it went on to become the number one desktop in the US. And the MacBook has continued to define the future of the notebook and is the number one notebook in the US. In fact, the Mac business has outpaced the PC business for several years now. And if you look at the last five years, the average annual growth rate isn't even close. And if you look at the total growth over that period of time, the Mac is up 100% versus the PC a paltry 18%. Now, for us, it's never been about making the most. We care much more that the Mac is number one in customer sat and quality. And you don't just have to take my word for it. All of these guys agree. Now, we had lots of innovation for the Mac last year. And one of those was announced here with Mountain Lion. Mountain Lion, of course, is our latest release of OS X. We've shipped 28 million copies since we announced it, making it the best-selling release of all time. And what's even more impressive is that 35% of our users are using the latest version, are using, are using Mountain Lion. Now, that compares to Windows 8, which is kind of struggling to get to 5. We're making the best Macs we've ever made but we're not standing still. We've got lots of innovation left, and today we want to talk to you about what we're doing with OS X. To do that, I'd like to invite Craig Federighi up to the stage.
Craig? Good morning. You guys are too kind. Good morning. Let's uh, talk about OS X. Our latest release, Mountain Lion, is the ninth of our big cat named releases in just over a decade. As we turn our attention now toward the 10th, we've hit a real issue. <laughs> we do not want to be the first software in history to be delayed due to a dwindling supply of cats. <laughs> now, fortunately, we do have a creative group at Apple, and we can think out of the box. And so we thought, maybe we could take this lion thing in a different direction. So I'm proud to present to you today OS X Sea Lion. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> OK, maybe not. That could be a bit of a dead end. So. <laughs> In fact, we're really excited about the future of the Mac, and we want a set of names that are going to carry us for at least the next 10 years. And you know, the answer really was really obvious to us. It's those places that inspire us here in California, in the place where OS X is designed and built. So for our first California-themed release, we went just outside our backyard, just off the coast, to a place with some of the biggest waves and most extreme surfing in all of North America, OS X Mavericks. Now, Mavericks is a release with deep technology focused on extending battery life and providing responsiveness. It has great new apps and enhancements for every Mac user and some features that we think are going to really appeal to our power users. And I want to talk about just three of them right now, starting with Finder tabs. <laughs> Sounds like you guys know how this is going to work. <laughs> so you, of course, can work in the Finder with multiple windows. It's a very powerful tool. But now you can draw all those windows together in tabs. And each tab can have its own location, its own view mode. It's really powerful, too. You can actually drag contents and hover across tabs. And of course, now that we have tabs in the Finder, it's also a great app to take full screen. Next, tagging. Yes. <laughs> that guy. We're bringing tagging to the Mac. So now, when you save a document, in addition to providing its location and name, you can tag it. And when you do, it'll appear right in the Finder sidebar. And in fact, you can tag things wherever they are, whether they're in iCloud or on a local file share. And all those will be brought together and appear in Finder. And tags are great for really powerful search as well. Next, yeah. Next, multiple displays. Really? All right. The Mac, of course, we're not giving you all the free multiple display here. This is a <laughs> software. So uh, with multiple displays in the Mac, it's always been a powerful way to spread out your work. But now, in Mavericks, you can get at your menus across multiple displays. You can summon your dock across multiple displays. And when you take a window full screen on one display, it doesn't mess with your desktop on the other display. And I really love this. When you pan your spaces, you can do it independently on each of your displays. Finally, if you have an AirPlay connected HD TV, it acts as a full power separate display as well. And I'd like to show all of this to you now. All right, let's take our first look here at Mavericks. And we're going to start with the Finder. So here's the Finder environment. I got a lot going on, a lot of windows, a lot of different locations. I'm going to go up here to the window menu, and let's merge all my windows. 
Just like that, they hop into a set of tabs. Now, of course, these tabs have different locations, different view settings for each of those locations. Creating a tab is just as you'd expect. Just click plus, I can select another location, like AirDrop, maybe another for this work file share I have going right here. And now that I have multiple uh, tabs, it's a really great way to actually work and copy documents. So if I want to copy this field report, I can just hover over the AirDrop tab, drop it, just like that, really nice. And of course, I can now take Finder full screen. Next, let's take a look at tagging. This is really cool. So as I go to save a document, you notice I can give it a name, like let's say project plan. And in addition to its location, in this case I'm gonna save it in iCloud, I can also give it a tag from any of the tags I've uh, made up. So I'm gonna call this document important. It looks pretty important to me. And we'll go here into the finder, and you see in the finder sidebar, I have an important tag and I see all these documents. They're from different locations, different applications, all drawn together in sidebar. We have other tags I've given things for things that are draft and in review. Now, of course, with tags, I can assign multiple tags to the same document. That's part of the power of tags. So I go here, and I'm going to say this one is also in review. And you notice as I assign that tag, it now appears in that location as well. And if I want to assign a totally new tag, I want to make up a tag on the fly, I can just type it right here. This is a website project I'm working on. It says create new tag website. And just like that, I've created a new tag, and you can see it right here in the finder. I can give that tag a color, of course. And now that I have that tag, I can also assign tags by just dragging things in to the tag area in the finder. So different assets for my website, just drag them in, and they're tagged like that. And tags are great for searching. So if I start typing, let's say, important, I can find all documents that are important. Let's go to all my files, and we'll find all documents that are both important and that are in review. And just like that, I found exactly what I'm looking for with tags. <laughs> Next, let's take a look at multiple displays. I'm gonna open up some of the kind of windows that I'm often working with. We'll open up iPhoto here, maybe a, a keynote presentation. And I actually have a second display connected to this uh, MacBook Pro. Let's uh, show that up there on the display now. Of course, with multiple displays, I can just move windows cross displays like you'd expect, but now I can get up at my menu bar on the second display. If I go down to the bottom, I can summon the dock just like that. If I want to open an app on the second display, I can just open it on the dock here, and here's uh, iTunes. I can take this app full screen just like that, and as I swipe spaces, just right back there just on that display. Let's take a Keynote full screen as well. I'm going to go back to my uh, first display here. Let's even take iPhoto full screen. So now I have different full screen apps on my different displays. It's actually a really fantastic way to work. Go in here into favorite travels, and I can now drag assets across my full screen apps like that. Super cool. And Mission Control has just been supercharged for multiple displays. So I'm going to go now into uh, Mission Control, and we see my different full screen spaces and uh, uh, desktops across applications. I can drag a window from one display to another. But I can also go and drag a full screen app right across displays, bring preview open, and now I have that full screen on this display as well. <laughs> Finally, I actually have an Apple TV uh, around here. Let's bring that into play. So here's my, here's my Apple TV. Now, uh, this, is, this is pretty over the top. So I can actually go here into uh, AirPlay, I'm gonna connect to this Apple TV. So now it's a full power display as well. You can see I have my menu bar and my dock. I can go over here and get my dock here. And I can go into mission control even, and I can go get a window across that other display. I'll just drag Keynote over here, right on to my Apple TV and open it up. There it is, full displays in Mavericks. Next, I'd like to talk about some advanced technologies in Mavericks. You know, our power users are increasingly doing their work on the go. 
they want great responsiveness, but they also want great battery life. And in Mavericks, we've introduced a whole host of technologies to address that challenge. Things like compressed memory that make sure you have memory available very quickly when apps demand it. Technologies like AppNap that actually make sure we're directing power only to those applications where you're really benefiting from it. System-wide core animation accelerated scrolling and OpenGL 4 for super responsive graphics. And a topic I want to go into in a bit more detail now, timer coalescing. So you know, when you look at battery life on your computer, the real factor that software has the most influence over is CPU activity and its draw on power. And if you look at what your system is doing at any given uh, time, what you'll see as you look under the hood is not a smooth line, but actually hundreds of interrupts occurring per second where the system is going from a power efficient sleep state up to a state of uh, high power use and back down. And all of those transitions actually consume a lot of power. Well, in Mavericks, we intelligently align all of that work, reducing those number of transitions. This, in combination with technologies like AppNap and other power optimizations, reduce CPU utilization activity for these kinds of scenarios up to 72%. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Next, let's talk about compressed memory. Nothing affects the performance of your Mac, the responsiveness more of a Mac that's under load than its ability to provide free memory to an app. Now, typically, when you look at your app runtime, all your memory isn't active. In fact, a subset of your memory is actively being used, and others is memory we have to keep around but isn't being used by the app. Well, now, if you open a document, your system is going to need to get free memory, and it does that in the past by writing those inactive bits of memory out to disk, and that's a slow process. Now, with compressed memory, we're able to rapidly compress the inactive memory, making free space available almost instantaneously to the application. This can have great effects on responsiveness of systems under load. You see 1.4x kinds of improvements, even on fast SSD systems for activities like opening new documents or reactivating an application, and up to 1.5x improvement for waking a system from standby. These are just two of many improvements to power and performance in Mavericks. Next, let's talk about Safari. In the last decade of life, Safari has focused not just on providing the easiest to use and most elegant browsing experience, but also the most innovative. These are the kinds of innovations that Safari has brought. Private browsing, blocking of third-party cookies for privacy, making the web easier to read with features like reading list, and the HTML5 audio and video tag, all Safari firsts. And the engine in Safari, WebKit, is used by over 1.5 billion devices. Well, in Mountain Lion, we're making Safari even better. We have a great, clean new home page with top sites. From there, you can get at a great sidebar where you have access to all of your bookmarks, and you can browse right from your bookmarks. And in that sidebar, we also have reading list, where now you can continuously scroll through your articles, moving from article to article without ever having to click. And a great new feature called shared links, where you see all of the links shared by people you're following on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can browse them right here. Now, in addition to these end user improvements, there's also a lot going on under the hood. Big improvements to JavaScript a full process per tab architecture and memory efficiency improvements with shared memory resource cache and a whole bunch of big power savings as well. When you look at the effects of these changes, it's pretty profound. If you take a synthetic benchmark like SunSpider, you see how Safari fares against the competition. But you know, researchers have started to look at more real world JavaScript by sampling the JavaScript that actually occurs on sites like the Google homepage, Facebook, Amazon.com. And when you look at Safari's performance on a benchmark like that, JS Bench, the results are really incredible. <laughs> Safari is also awesome when it comes now to memory usage, using way less memory than the other browsers, which means more memory for you to browse with more tabs and do more on your system. 
And when it comes to energy use, it's not even close. Safari uses way less energy than Chrome, and when you compare to Firefox, it's just kind of sad. <laughs> so that's Safari. I'd love to give you a demo of some of our advanced technologies in Safari right now. So let's start with responsiveness. And I'm gonna go now into uh, mail. And so here we have a mailbox with a, about 100,000 messages in your, your inbox. And I just wanna show you how, uh, how you scroll now with that accelerated scrolling. Perfectly smooth, incredibly fast, almost 60 frames a second whenever you do it. It's just epic. And when you look here at scrolling through a conversation, this is a conversation with 26 messages in it. Again, just super glassy smooth, super fast. It's really, really nice. Let's take a look at that in Safari. In Safari, we've improved scrolling for more popular websites and actually optimized heavily for retina displays. So now it's just super fast, super smooth. Now let's take a look at power. Yeah, there's a fan of smooth scrolling right there in the front. I'm a fan of smooth scrolling as well. So let's take a look at power usage. I have a power meter up here that's showing CPU activity in Safari. And you notice right now it's quite low because we're not doing anything. But let's go into a, a website that's uh, going to use a lot of power. And you notice the power meter shoot right up because we're doing a lot of animation here, using a lot of CPU. And that's OK. That's what the CPU is for. It's doing something cool for me right here. But very often you'll have something like this happening in an ad off in the corner. You've covered this window up, and yet it's still draining your battery life. You don't even realize it. Well, now with this technology we call AppNap, we keep track of what's going on and what things you actually see to decide where to direct power. So watch what happens when I bring up this uh, iTunes window over the Safari window. Power drops right down. That's extending your battery life. But of course, that thing is still running. It's still available to me. So if I pull it aside, there it goes. You can see everything happening right now. The power goes up, cover it back up, power goes right back down. It's really going to help your battery life. <laughs> Next, let's take a look at the new Safari top sites. Really clean, really nice. We'll bring out the new sidebar. You see I have all my bookmarks here. I have my bookmark folders as well. If I want to bring a uh, site over from my bookmarks into top sites. I can just drag it out like this. It's really nice. I can open it up. Animates in. From the sidebar, we also have access uh, to our shared links. So you see sites that I'm following here on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. I can click on a, site, a link that's been shared, uh, loads it up. I can even uh, retweet it uh, right here if I, if I wish. And we now have one click bookmarking. So I'll just click this plus and it's going to hop right in to my reading list right there. Let's go take a look at my reading list. See all the, uh, the articles I've added here to my reading list. I want you to watch how scrolling works because now when I scroll and I'm reading through one article, I read this, this is great, really enjoying it, get to the bottom, there's the next article. I can just scroll right through to the next article just like that. Awesome. We also have a beautiful new look for Reader. Here's Reader. And I'm going to bring up uh, my, uh, I can actually close up my, my sidebar here. And now as I scroll reading, and I just want to read from one article to the next, it's just like that. Super clean and super nice. And that's Safari in Mavericks. I think you're going to like it. So we have some more improvements that I think are going to really help you with your browsing. And one of them is iCloud Keychain. Yeah. You know, to really be secure these days, you want to have a co different, complex password for every site where you have a login. But this inevitably brings up the question, what's my password? And these solutions are not recommended. <laughs> there is a better way. With iCloud Keychain, we can remember your website logins, your credit card numbers, even your Wi-Fi networks. And they're always encrypted synced across all of your systems so they're always available to you. Now, when you go sign up for a website, you can, of course, enter your own password and we'll remember it. But as well, Safari can auto-suggest a password for you. 
You don't have to remember that, but it'll enter it in for you and then sync it across all of your systems and log in for you from then on. <laughs> iCloud Keychain is great for your shopping as well. When you come to a credit card field, you can suggest any of your remembered credit cards, select one, and it'll just enter it in for you just like that along with your expiration date, but you have to remember your own security code. That's what makes it secure after all. <laughs> and that's iCloud Keychain. Yeah. <laughs> Next, some improvements to notifications. So now with notifications on the Mac, if you're a, a Californian like me, you'll often get this kind of notification hey, want to go surf these 30-foot waves? And your response surely is to mouse over the notification and immediately right there reply, yeah, sure, I'm going to surf that 30-foot wave. You can reply right inside the notification. And you can do this for things like email and quickly delete email you might not want to deal with without even having to go to mail. If you get a FaceTime call, you can respond saying, hey, I'm going to call you later or remind without having to pick up the call. It's really handy. We also handle a new kind of notification so if you have an app today that sends push notifications to iOS devices, well now you can sign up to receive those push notifications on your Mac as well, whether Safari is running or not. So things like your fantasy football alert, maybe breaking news, <laughs> news about that buy on eBay, and now, in Mavericks, when your machine is sleeping, when you wake it up, it'll tell you everything that you missed while you're away right on the lock screen. And it'll now update apps for you right in the background so you don't have to do it yourself. So that's notifications. Next up, calendar. Let's take a look. Absolutely no virtual cows were harmed in the making of this user interface. <laughs> we're going to be adding that one to our environmental checklist, trust us. So in addition to that, you have your Facebook uh, events right on your calendar if you wish. And we have a great new inspector that's even aware of things like location, travel time, and weather. And that's your calendar. Next, maps. The maps team has been making great improvements to the data and maps, and Mac users are going to benefit because we have this fantastic new maps app. Of course, with your street maps, you have your 3D, beautiful flyover data, search for points of interest, great info cards. You can get turn-by-turn -turn directions. And my favorite part, when I have a route that I've set up on my Mac and now it's time to go, you can just click right up here and send it right to my iPhone where it'll appear right on my lock screen. And when I unlock my phone, it takes me straight into navigation. Super cool. We're also providing a developer SDK so you can add mapping functionality to your apps as well. So that's Maps. Finally, we're bringing iBooks to the Mac. So now you have access to the full library of 1.8 million books in the iBook store. Your full library from your iOS devices is available on your Mac as well. It's a great environment for reading. It's also a great environment for taking notes, and it supports iBooks, textbooks, they're beautiful, and they're interactive. I'd love to give you a demo of all of this right now. So let's start in maps. So here we are in Paris. You can just zoom in. Do we have someone from Paris there? You uh, can zoom right in. You see it's just so fast and fluid, bringing in points of location. 
I can pan around the map, find a nice location, maybe the Eiffel Tower right here. Let's go in to look at that flyover data. So we can see the Eiffel Tower. Can go into tilt it over. See the Eiffel Tower right there. The flyover data is just beautiful. And of course, I can uh, even rotate around Paris. Look, you can even see through the Eiffel Tower as it rotates into the area of the city below. The data is just gorgeous, the new flyover data. It's really amazing on your big Mac display. Of course, we support great search for points of interest. So if I want to go to lunch, maybe at, I'm told this is Guy Savoie. We'll go to Guy Savoie. We have these great info cards with reviews, photos. I can add a site to my bookmarks just like this. And it's now synced across all my devices, so this location is available to me, of course, on my phone. And because this is a Mac, I can tear these off. So if I'm planning a trip, I can set aside some things of interest. I can, of course, get directions. Let's do that here, directions from the Eiffel Tower. And when I'm ready to go, I can send it right to my phone, like this. And that's Max. Next, let's take a look at the new calendar. It has continuous scrolling, and what's really amazing is even without the stitching, the window still sticks right there on the screen. It doesn't fall off without the stitching. I don't know how we did it. It's engineering. Uh, it's really great for creating events. So if I go and create an event like this, let's say I'm going to have lunch. And now I'm going to type in uh, what, I, what I want to have for lunch. So I'm going to say I want pizza. And you notice it suggests all sorts of locations nearby. So I'm going to select uh, Tony's Pizza. And you notice I get a map. I even get projected weather for that location, so I know if I need to uh, bring a jacket. Now I can select here and actually ask it to tell me what the travel time is expected from my last location. So I can decide if I want to drive or walk. I'm going to say I want to walk. And it actually adds the travel time right to my calendar, so I know not to schedule anything there. <laughs> And I don't have to remember because I can ask to be notified when I need to leave, and I'll get a notification both on my Mac and on my phone as well. So that is Maps. <laughs> Finally, let's take a look at iBooks. So I have all my books here. Of course, can browse my co the collections I've arranged. We have access to the store with all of its content. Books, of course, is ultimately about reading. So you can get in here and read, move easily between the pages. You have access to all the controls you'd expect. Your bookmarks, search, can adjust your type of font and type size, go into a nice night mode that's relaxing for the eyes. But of course, I really love these interactive iBooks textbooks. Let's open one of those up now. So I can scroll through the pages of my book, see all these nice interactives and videos. I can pinch right into a graphical table of contents. Scroll through the pages of this chapter. You can select another chapter. Scroll through just like this. Look at these fantastic interactives. So if I want to understand the way the cellular structure works, for instance, on this leaf, you can just drill right in. See all the way through like this. It's just incredible. Really great way to learn. Yeah. It's also a great environment for taking notes. You can just select some text, add a note, uh, ask the teacher about this. Take a note like that. Because it's a Mac, of course, I can just stretch out, get a sidebar where I can see all my notes in the sidebar, which is really convenient, just like this. We also have a great view with a sidebar to show all your notes. You can use them to navigate your book. When it comes time to study, we have these great study cards. You can just flip through them, use all your notes, study, just like that. And that is iBooks in Mavericks. So Mavericks continues making your 
digital life follow you easily from device to device. So now your books are available on whatever device you choose to read them on. Remembers what page you're reading. We now remember your passwords, so they're available to you across all your devices, even now your bookmark location and travel routes. Mavericks is a fantastic release. It's full of some great features for power users, deep technology to extend your battery life and improve system responsiveness, and some great features for everyone. For those of you developers, we have a preview available for you today. And for everyone else, in the general public, you'll be getting the final release this fall. So that is Mavericks. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Phil Schiller to tell you a little bit more about the Mac. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk to you about the MacBook Air. The MacBook Air answered the question, in this age of the iPad, what is the future of the notebook? The MacBook Air really gave us a direction of where the notebook can go. And it's really become everyone's ultimate everyday notebook. And that's why we're really pleased to tell you today that we've updated an entirely new line of MacBook Air. And these new MacBook Airs deliver the most important feature we always want in a portable device all day battery life. Yes. Now the MacBook Air is based on a new fourth generation Intel core processor, otherwise known as Haswell ULT. And if you don't know Haswell ULT, it's a great processor for incredible power savings. It has more energy efficient CPUs. It has twice the graphics execution units. So we can run them actually at a slower clock speed to save energy and still deliver up to 40% faster graphics performance. And the Apple engineers have worked together with the Intel en engineers on some great low power states. So we can do things like wake up in one second or have standby for up to 30 days. But the biggest benefit is battery life. So here's the current generation MacBook Air, 11 inch and 13 inch. The 11 inch is now going to go from five hours of battery life up to an incredible nine hours of battery life. And if you like that, the 13 goes from seven to 12 hours of battery life. Yes. True, all day battery life. And it helps across your entire system. For example, if you like watching movies from iTunes, up to 10 hours, you can watch almost the entire trilogy of Lord of the Rings. It's amazing. And of course, MacBook Air is based entirely on Flash. Flash is faster, up to 45% faster than the previous version. And Wi-Fi is flat faster too. Now, 802.11ac Wi-Fi networking. Now, AC gets you up to three times the performance of 802.11n at the same distance. But the way to get that, of course, is you want your MacBook Air to talk to a Wi-Fi base station that supports 802.11ac. So we're really happy to, along with MacBook Air, announce some new airport base stations. Entirely new designs. They're actually a very small base, just four inches square, but extruded six and a half inches to get wider range from those antennas. So there's a new Airport Extreme that does 802.11ac. There's also room in there for a hard drive, so we have a new Airport Time Capsule as well. And these are great base stations. They're incredibly powerful. They have a lot of cool features. I'll just point out one, beamforming. It even sounds cool. Beamforming <laughs> can send more energy directly to an 802.11ac device to enhance the throughput and performance. So these are great base stations. The MacBook Air comes in 11 inch and 13 inch sizes, and the value is even greater than before. The 11 inch starts at 999 with 128 gigabytes. That's twice the storage at the same price as before. And the 13 inch with 128 gigs starts at 1099. That's $100 less expensive than before. And these new MacBook Airs start shipping today. As we have for a while now, we're really proud that we lead the industry in the most environmentally friendly products. 
So we're going to make sure everyone knows how important this is to have Energy Star 5.2, most products don't. EP Gold, most don't. Arsenic free display glass, mercury free, free displays, BFR free, PVC free, and highly recyclable. We lead at this and we're going to continue to. So that's the new MacBook Air. They're faster graphics, longer battery life, better value, faster Wi Fi, incredible notebooks. We're going to do something different. We don't usually do this, but you're a really important audience. So we'd like to give you a sneak peek of something we're working on. Would you like that? <laughs> Only because you're 6,000 of my most important friends. <laughs> Video editors, musicians, photographers, Graphic designers count on products like Mac Pro to get their work done. And our most advanced users just want to get their hands on the fastest, most expandable Mac we make. And the Mac Pro is really important to delivering on that. We didn't want to just make another version of the same old desktop idea that everyone's had. Like with MacBook Air, our engineering team has spent quite a bit of time thinking about the technology available today and what could be possible for the future of a pro desktop? What would be a new form factor, new design, new capabilities for another 10 years? And the engineering team has come up with something truly revolutionary, truly radical. And this product is so cool. Well, I'm going to go a little over the top and give it a grand introduction that is unlike any introduction we've ever had for a product. So I am really pleased to give you, our closest friends, the first glimpse of the next generation of Mac Pro. Can't innovate anymore, my ass. <laughs> this is thank you. This is a machine unlike anything we've ever made, both inside and out. The processor, graphics, memory storage are all built around a new unified thermal core. That even sounds cool. <laughs> inside is state-of-the-art technology, a new generation Intel Xeon chip, up to 12 core configs, 256-bit wide floating point, PCI Express Gen 3. This is double the CPU performance of the previous generation. The fastest memory we've ever put in a product. ECC memory, 1866 megahertz DDR3 on a four channel controller, 60 gigabyte per second bandwidth. That's double the performance of the previous generation. Internal storage is based on flash, not any old flash, new PCIe based flash. 1.25 gigabytes per second reads, a gigabyte per second writes. That's two and a half, half times faster than any flash we've ever built. It's 10 times faster than any hard drive we've put in a Mac Pro before. All expansion is external. You can add storage arrays. You can add expansion chassis over the brand new announced Thunderbolt 2. This is 20 gigabit per second. 
up to six Thunderbolt 2 devices per port. It's backwards compatible with Thunderbolt 1 and Firewire, and it's double the performance of the industry standard and industry leading Thunderbolt 1. But the place where the team has probably gone the most crazy and done something we've never done before is in graphics. This is the first Mac ever that comes standard with dual workstation GPUs. AMD Fire Pro graphics in it. You can configure it up to 4,096 stream processors, 528 gigabytes per second. This is two and a half times the graphics performance of the last generation. And for those of you who use OpenCL, and you all know you should, this delivers seven teraflops of compute power to your applications. Of course, you want to hook on the latest third-party displays, and this supports 4K displays. Yes. Multiple streams of 4K displays. You can have up to three 4K displays on the built-in dual workstation graphics. The Final Cut Pro team is hard at work on a version of Final Cut Pro 10 that will support all the performance and graphics capabilities of this machine. You can be this guy. <laughs> it is a Mac unlike any we've ever made. It delivers so much more performance, capabilities, and expansion than anything we've made. And here it is alongside the previous generation. <laughs> the team has packed all this capability inside one eighth the volume of the previous generation. The one thing everyone loved about the old generation Mac Pro was those handles on the top so you can move it around to get access to the I.O. Well, the entire top of the new generation Mac Pro is a handle. Just put your hand in it, you can spin it around, get access to the I.O. It's all organized beautifully on the back for you. There is audio, four USB 3, six FireWire 2 being driven by three FireWire 2 controllers. And you guys who use this stuff know what I'm talking about. It's gigabit Ethernet, HDMI out, and it has a motion sensor, so when you turn it, it even lights up to show you where the I.O. is. <laughs> it is a stunning product. This is without doubt the future of the Pro desktop. It is coming later this year. I did say this is a sneak peek. It is designed by brilliant engineers in California and assembled here in the USA. And for all of you who are dying to see it put through its paces and what it can do, we have a special session tomorrow, a lunchtime session for all the developers here, where our good friends at Pixar, along with developers from the Foundry, are going to show you some amazing character animation from the upcoming movie, Monsters U, running on the new generation Mac Pro, and you want to check it out. And that's the Mac Pro. Back to you, Tim. You're going to love the Mac Pro. It's, it's, it's killer. Next, I'd like to talk about iCloud. We've now passed 300 million iCloud accounts, making iCloud the fastest growing cloud service ever. Now, by comparison, it took Facebook five years to reach this many accounts. One of the most popular features of iCloud is iTunes in the cloud which makes all of your purchase content available on all of your devices. We now have 300 million users of this feature, and they've re their content 35 billion times. Now, the backend infrastructure of iCloud allows us to provide cloud services across many of our products, like Game Center, our social gaming network, now with over 240 million users. 60 of the top 100 games on the App Store integrate Game Center support right in their game. iCloud is also has incredible scale, like sending 800 billion iMessages, or a mind-boggling 7.4 trillion push notifications. <laughs> iCloud allows us to seamlessly integrate 
cloud services into so many of our products across Apple in both OS X and iOS. Today, we want to share with you how we are deeply integrating iCloud into the next version of iWork. And to do that, I'd like to invite Roger Rosner up to the stage. Roger? Hello. All right, let me tell you a little bit about iWork. iWork is pages, numbers, and keynote, and we think it's the best way to create beautiful documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. Of course, iWork was born on the Mac, and it has full support for the awesome feature set of Mac OS X and Mac hardware. We also have amazingly powerful and fully multi-touch versions of these apps on the iPad and on the iPhone. We think our multi-touch apps are the most powerful productivity apps ever created for a mobile device. And later this year, we're going to have awesome new releases of both our Mac and our iOS suites. But today, I want to introduce the newest member of the iWork family, introducing iWork for iCloud. iWork for iCloud lets you create beautiful documents right in a browser on a Mac or on a PC. And rather than talk about it, let's just jump right into a demo. All right, I'm going to fire up Safari on my Mac here and go straight to my iCloud homepage where you see three new app icons. I'm going to click on Pages. And here's all the documents I've been working on on my Mac or my iPad and saved in iCloud. I can create a new document by clicking plus, and I have a bunch of beautiful Apple design templates. But let's just open a document we were working on. And as you can see, it's a beautiful pages document. Great fonts, graphics, images, page layouts. This is all happening on a web browser, of course. So I can just click here and type. And over here, I have all the formatting controls in our new context-sensitive format panel. So I'll just select some text, go up to my styles, choose a text style, select some more text, choose another. I can click on some images. You see my controls now show me image controls. You can click on a bunch of styles, choose that one. Now, of course, Pages has always been great at handling graphics. So how do I add graphics? Well, I drag one in from my desktop, drop it in there, and drag it around. All right, now, we know we live in a world full of Microsoft Office documents. So how do we work with Office? Well, I have a Word document here. And I'm just going to drag that in from my desktop and drop that in the Pages for iCloud window. It uploads it. I open it up. And here I am editing a Microsoft Word document in Pages for iCloud. All right, let's take a look at numbers. Back to my iCloud homepage, click the numbers icon. Again, a bunch of beautiful documents. As you can see, this spreadsheet has a bunch of different sheets in it, great charts, great tables, and graphics. Here on the last sheet, we have a table that hasn't been finished. So I'm just going to click in a cell, hit equals. We get help for the over 250 functions that we have. But I'll just type sum, select this column, and there you go. My chart updates. If I want to fill this across the rest of the table, I just drag it across. A real spreadsheet, again, this is all happening in a web browser. All right, let's try Keynote. I will open this presentation here. And it's a real Keynote presentation. Photographs, text, fonts. I can rearrange the slides if I want to. I can add a new slide. I'll click the plus button down here, choose this layout. Let's give it a title. 
And let's, let's drag an image in. Move it around, get the alignment guides we all love from Keynote. Double click to go into masking mode. Scale up that mask a little. Recenter it. Let's, uh, let's give it a photo border. Let's make the border a little thicker. Let's, let's rotate the image. This is all happening in a browser. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> How about animations? Let's add a cube animation here. And click play. And there, you see our beautiful Keynote 3D animations in a browser window. All right, I'm sure everyone wants to know how does this work on Windows? Well, here it is. This is a Windows 8 desktop. I have IE and Chrome here. I'm just going to fire up Chrome. <laughs> and it's logged in as the same user I was logged into on the Mac, so I'm going to open that same document. As you can see, it's the same. There's the slide we just made. Let's uh, go in there and make that mask a little bit tighter and move it around a little. And there you go, I'm editing a keynote document on Windows 8. <laughs> All right, that is Iron for iCloud. Now, we know in a lot of cases that the best user experiences are made with native app technologies, but I think you can see with Iron for iCloud, you can do some pretty great stuff on the web. As I mentioned, we support I, or we support Safari best, I should say. Uh, like all websites, we run best in Safari. We also support IE and Chrome. And now you have iWork on all your devices. You can create a document on your Mac, you can edit on your PC, and you can present from your iPhone. We're going to make this available starting today as a developer beta. Just go to iCloud, and we'll expand that beta to include all users of iCloud later in the year. Thank you very much. Send us your feedback. Okay. Next, we'd like to turn our attention to iOS. Of course, iOS is the world's most advanced mobile operating system and powers the world's best mobile devices, iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. We have now sold over 600 million iOS devices. It's an incredible number. But it's extraordinary and we're proud of it. But it's not what drives us. We want to make the best products that people use more and love more than anyone else's. And I'm really happy to tell you people are using our products substantially more than anyone else's. Let me show you. This recent study from Experian showed that iPhone users use the iPhone 50% more than Android users use their phone. Now, this is incredible, but, but maybe not surprising. And <laughs> if you look at mobile web share, it's not even close. iOS is two and a half times Android. And if you look at iPads compared to all other tablets, it's not even comparable. iPad is over four times more. Now, this shows up in a variety of ways. As an example, just like iOS customers buy more of your incredible apps, they evidently also buy a lot of everything else, according to a recent IBM survey. Both iPhone and iPad customers we're responsible for materially more mobile shopping traffic than all other Android devices combined on the most critical day of shopping last year. Now, it probably doesn't surprise you if people are using them more, they love them more. And this is what is most important to us iPhone was named number one in customer satisfaction by JD Power not just once, 
but nine consecutive times. The first time this has ever been done. And iOS satisfaction is literally off the charts. ChangeWage recently measured it at 97%. And if you look at those people that responded that they're very satisfied, and really look at the detail, which I'm sometimes known to do, <laughs> you would see that iOS blows out everyone else, 20 points better than our closest competitor and almost 25 points better than Android. <laughs> One of the reasons for this is that we provide amazing software updates that provide users incredible new features. And we do this easily and make them available to as many users as possible. Let me show you. Over 90% of iOS users are using the latest version of iOS. Now that's in stark contrast to the world of Android. <laughs> and by the way, this is the most ideal state of Android. It only includes those versions of Android which talk to the Google Play Store. So it doesn't include things like Kindles and Nooks. But even then, it's a pretty bleak story. More than a third of Android users are using an operating system that was released in 2010. And if you look at the customers of each operating system, which are using the latest version, it's not even close. Now, this isn't just bad for users, but this version fragmentation is terrible for developers, as many of you know. In fact, if you do the math, you would find that iOS 6 is the world's most popular mobile operating system, and in second place is a version of Android which was released in 2010. Now, this is why we get so excited when we're working on a new version of iOS, because we know that we can positively affect millions of developers, and hundreds of millions of users. And that is exactly what we've been up to. The team at Apple has been working incredibly hard on the latest version of iOS. And today, it's a great thrill that I announce iOS 7. iOS 7 is the biggest change to iOS since the introduction of iPhone. It's packed with amazing new features and a stunning new user interface. We prepared a video to show you our thinking behind the design, and I'd like to run it for you now. We have always thought of design as being so much more than just the way something looks. It's the whole thing, the way something actually works on so many different levels. Ultimately, of course, design defines so much of our experience. I think there is a profound and enduring beauty in simplicity, in clarity, in efficiency. True simplicity is derived from so much more than just the absence of clutter and ornamentation. It's about bringing order to complexity. iOS 7 is a clear representation of these goals. It has a whole new structure 
that is coherent and that is applied across the entire system. We've considered the tiniest details, like refining the typography, to much larger ones, like redesigning all the icons. And developing a grid system allowed us to achieve a much more harmonious relationship between individual elements. We've also incorporated a whole new palette of colors. Distinct functional layers help establish hierarchy and order. And the use of translucency gives you a sense of your context. These planes, combined with new approaches to animation and motion, create a sense of depth and vitality. The iPhone, responding to your movements, drives the parallax to create a whole new experience of depth. In many ways, we've tried to create an interface that is unobtrusive and deferential. One where the design recedes, and in doing so, actually elevates your content. Even the simple act of changing your wallpaper has a very noticeable effect on the way your iPhone looks and feels across the entire system. While iOS 7 is completely new, it was important to us to make it instantly familiar. We wanted to take an experience that people know very well and actually add to it to make it more useful, to make it more enjoyable. To create it, we brought together a broad range of expertise from design to engineering. With what we've been able to achieve together, we see iOS 7 as defining an important new direction and in many ways, a beginning. Absolutely love iOS 7. Love you. <laughs> this, thank you. This major effort, this major effort is only possible because of the incredible collaboration between Johnny and his amazing design team and Craig and his incredible engineering team. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Craig back up to take you through iOS 7, the biggest change to iOS since the iPhone. Craig? Well, on behalf of all of the engineers and designers who worked so hard to make today a reality, I'm absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity to show you iOS 7. Let's take a look. It's unbelievable. It's just gorgeous. From the typography on this lock screen to the vitality of the background and the animation to the home screen with these icons. It looks so great. They just look fantastic. And, you know, a lot of us have our own wallpaper. You know, we like pictures of our family there. And now that liveliness actually carries through 
to the home screen because as you move the device in your hand, it actually tracks your motion and has parallax that exp you can see behind the icons. It's really incredible. And it carries over across the system, this liveliness. I mean, just take a look at something like weather, where the motion conveys this information and where the edge-to-edge -edge design just takes advantage of every pixel on that retina display. It's so nice. It's great for apps you use every day, like messages, <laughs> your calendar, your email is gorgeous. Your friends never looked more attractive. <laughs> and Game Center, we just completely ran out of green felt. <laughs> and wood as well, this has gotta be good for the environment. The clocks look great. And even apps like Stocks and Compass, I mean, they just have this look of precision, this sense of purpose. The best way to appreciate iOS 7 is to see it live. I'd like to give you a demo right now. <clears throat> so let's take our first live look at iOS 7. Here it is. You can see how the device actually responds to the motion in my hand. Just slide out the lock screen. You see how it slides in. I want you all to look away for a moment while I type in my... <laughs> Okay, you can look again. Okay, don't tell anyone about that. All right. So here we, here we are on the gorgeous new home screen. Let's go into weather. You see on weather, it's a little cloudy today. I can actually tap here. The degrees get more information like humidity and rain. Let's swipe through some locations. Clear in Sydney. Kind of hot in Phoenix. Here in... Uh, Big Thunder Mountain, it's looking a little, little rough. We've got some, uh, some thunder brewing. Oh yeah. <laughs> some heavy snow here in the North Pole. And uh, <laughs> tropical storm here in Gilligan's Island. I hope they, they got off that island. <laughs> so, and it's more functional than ever. If you pinch, you get this gorgeous overview of all your cities even with the time, so it's a world clock as well. Let's take a look at the calendar. So clean, swipe from days to day like this, turn it into landscape, see your whole week at a glance, got a big week ahead. Zoom out, scroll easily through your months, and even go all the way out to the year. Let's take a look at messages. Notice as we scroll, we have this great sort of playful motion. The bubbles, let's bring up the keyboard. As you slide contents of the keyboard, you see the layering and transparency. It gives you that sense of context. There's this gesture now from the left edge of the device. It's great for using the device with one hand. If I wanna just go back, I can just swipe from the edge of the display, pull back like that, move in and out. So clean and natural. Let's take a look at folders. I'm going to go here into my games folder. I can now have multiple pages, store hundreds of items in my folders. It's awesome. Take a look at uh, Game Center. So, some of those good looking friends. Let's take a look at mail. I mean, the type is just so clean. When you drill into a message, look at how you get these full screen, edge to edge photos. It's really great. And that gesture for moving in and out works here too, of course. It's just move between messages, just like this. It's so great. And if you just slide across on any item, you can get at the trash and more options as well, right here in mail. Finally, let's take a look at Notification Center. Same as always, we can just swipe down from the top of the device, it comes down with a nice thud can see all notifications, just my missed ones. And we have this great new today view. So you can see your friends' birthdays, current look at the weather, your upcoming uh, in, uh, invitations, your calendar, your stocks, and even a quick look at tomorrow. You know what's really great is for the first time ever, Notification Center is now available 
from the lock screen as well. You don't even have to unlock your device. So that's a quick look at iOS 7. It's a comprehensive end-to-end -end redesign of the user experience. Installing iOS 7 on your phone is like getting an entirely new phone, but one you already know how to use, one that's so much more beautiful and functional than ever before. But iOS 7 is actually more than that. It's also a major feature release as well. I have 10 features I want to talk to you about today, starting with Control Center. Control Center is something that's so simple and yet so essential. You have those switches that you just want to get to really quickly from wherever you are. Well, now with Control Center, swipe up from the bottom of the device, and there they are. Turn on airplane mode, adjust your brightness, play a song, even get at a flashlight. And available from anywhere, including your lock screen. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you need to find something, your flashlight's right there. And that's Control Center. Next, let's talk about multitasking. Now, iOS 7 has always been built on the industrial strength foundations of OS 10. It's had intrinsic, powerful multitasking capabilities but we had to be careful about how we've exposed these to applications because we want to preserve great battery life. Now in iOS 4, we did add support for select kinds of applications to do multitasking, things like playing music in the background or receiving a voice over IP call while your app was in the background. Well now, in iOS 7, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to have multitasking for all apps with great battery life. So how does it work? Well, imagine you have an app that you're using constantly throughout the day, a social networking app or something, and you're checking in all the time. Well, iOS 7 has noticed that pattern of use and is going to provide that app with frequent background activity to stay up to date. And let's see if another app you use, maybe that you just check in on in the morning, at breakfast, maybe at night after work. Well, iOS 7 notices that too, and it's going to give that app background cycles just in time, so it's up to date for when you need it. Now, in addition to this intelligent scheduling, iOS 7 does opportunistic updates. The average user wakes their device dozens of times a day, and those provide great opportunities when the system's already powered up to update apps in the background. It also adapts intelligently to network conditions. So if it's in, you have good coverage, it's a great time to fetch and it coalesces updates across multiple applications. So once you have those radios powered up, let's multiple applications take advantage of it for their background updates. And finally, iOS 7 responds to push notifications as a trigger to give that application time in the background. So when you follow that notification, the app will already be up to date. Now, iOS 7 also has a great new user interface for moving between all the things you have going on on your phone. Now, you can double click and move into Notification Center and just swipe between your running applications, tap, and move right in. And that is multitasking in iOS 7. <laughs> Next, let's talk about Safari. Safari is the most popular mobile browser in the world. And in iOS 7, we're making it even better. Has a great new full screen look, so you can really focus on your content. If you pull down or tap at the top, you can now get a smart search field. From that search field, you can get it one tap access to all of your favorites, as well as do search and access URLs. And it has a great new interface for your tabs. In addition to all of this, it has parental controls and integration with the same iCloud keychain you saw earlier with Mavericks. I'd like to give you a demo of Safari now. Let's take a look. OK. Let's head on in to Safari. So here we are in Safari. I'm going to just zoom in on this page. Why don't you watch as I scroll, 
all the controls just recede, and now you have that full screen for your content. We've really improved the way you navigate now in Safari. I'm just going to tap in here to a link to a detailed story. We can even zoom in, of course, on this page. And that same gesture you saw earlier for going back, well, of course, that works in Safari as well. So I just swipe in from the edge of the display, and I can navigate back and forth through my browser history just like that. It's such a fantastic way to browse. Next, let's look at that unified search field. I'm just going to tap up here at the top. You see how I have one tap access to all my favorites. It's really convenient, but I'm going to type in this case. So I'll type D-I-S. And you notice I have a top URL hit as well as Google search suggestions as well, available all right here. We've really improved bookmarking as well. I'll use this bookmark control down at the bottom. I see my bookmark folders, all my bookmarks. We also have shared links. You can see stories posted by people you follow on Twitter and my reading list. And now just like you saw in Mavericks, on iOS you can scroll continuously from article to article without coming back to the list. It's really awesome. Next, let's take a look at uh, tabs. I'm going to click here at the bottom, into tabs. Unbelievable. And you're no longer limited to just eight. And down at the bottom are also all your iCloud tabs. You can see what you left open on your other devices as well. And tabs, they're really nice to use. You can just tap, just sweep into a tab, back out, back in, back out. It's just fantastic. If you want to reorder your tabs, just tap and hold. Just rearrange them like this. And if you're done with a tab, just swipe it off to the side and it goes away. And that's the new Safari. Let's take a look now at Control Center. So I'm just going to swipe up from the bottom of my display, and up comes Control Center. See, so I have these great switches at the top. I can turn on and off Do Not Disturb, for instance. Access my brightness. I can even access a flashlight, really useful at night. Play a song. And of course, this is available to me everywhere. So if I'm in Safari, for instance, let's bring it up here. You can turn off that music. And you notice how it's layering and transparency. Take the personality of the environment where you bring it up. That's Control Center. Next up, multitasking. It's just a great way to get across all the things you're doing on your device. So if I just double click here on my home button, jump into multitasking, I can just swipe across everything I have running. I want to move into one, messages, double tap, back out, move into mail, back out, just like this. It's really, really nice. That's multitasking in iOS 7. Thank you. So, of course, there's, there's much, much more to iOS 7, including AirDrop. <laughs> AirDrop is absolutely the easiest way to share with the people that are right around you. So now, when you're in any app that supports a share sheet, you bring up the share sheet, and your friends that are all around you just show up right there. You tap on one, and they're going to get a uh, panel right on their display, and they can accept what it is that you shared. They accept it, they're taken right into the app. And you know if you want to share with multiple people, you just tap, tap, tap. No need to wander around the room bumping your phone <laughs> with others. Now this is system-wide for any app that supports the share sheet, and of course, it uses peer-to-peer -peer Wi-Fi for maximum speed, and all your transmissions are securely encrypted. Because it uses the latest Wi-Fi hardware, it's supported on the iPhone 5, the fourth generation iPad, iPad mini, and the fifth generation iPod Touch. And that is AirDrop. Next, let's talk about the camera. So now, your camera in iOS 7 is four cameras in one. You can just swipe from your video camera to your photo camera, to your square cropped camera, 
to your pano camera. And when you're taking stills, you now have access to live photo filters from some gorgeous black and whites to some classic color filters as well. So with your great new camera, we want to give you a great new way to manage your photos, and it's the new Photos app. You know, for many users, this is what their photo organization looks like. An endless, unorganized stream of their camera roll. We've all been there. But you know, it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> There's great information in those photos. iOS knows where you took the photos and when you took them, and that provides inherent structure that we can use to organize those photos. And now, in Photos in iOS 7, we do. We organize them into moments, and I'd like to give you a demo of that right now. So let's take a look now at the Photos app. So here you see some photos that were taken in San Francisco, and you see nothing was done to organize these photos explicitly, and yet they have these labels like the Palace of Fine Arts, Baker Beach, Lombard Street, it provides this natural organization for appreciating the photos. We can go up to more trips, more time in San Francisco, Golden Gate, San Francisco Fisherman's Wharf, but then you see we have home. We have photos taken at home and photos taken at the elementary school and around that area. And now if you want to zoom back out to get a, a more of a bird's eye view of your collection, we draw these moments intelligently together into collections. So see here how that multiple day trip around San Francisco is collected, sorry about that, I got a little excited there, into, <laughs> it's a very exciting interface, into a multi-day trip in San Francisco. And that time at home and around the school, well that's one moment, that's one collection as well. It's a really great way to browse your photos. You can even go all the way out to the year level. Look across your whole photo collection. And look at how we pull out the interesting places that you went in that year, like 2011 was Colorado and Hawaii, 2012 went to South America. You may not remember when you did it, but iOS does. And it's right there. And you know, with this retina display, you can even kind of make out patterns of photos and when different occasions are. And of course, we found like we had the urge that we wanted to just tap in right from here. And so now, in fact, you can. You can just tap and scrub and find the photo you're looking for just like that. It's really just amazing. So I can just pick a photo here, whichever one I want. It's kind of cute. And now we can edit it because we have photo filters. So I can go into the filters here. I can try different color effects. And if I find one I like, maybe a nice black and white, I can do it just like that. I'll apply it, save that photo away. We also have great new ways to share your photos in the Photos app. So let's bring up sharing. We have. Uh, AirDrop right here, if any of you were running iOS 7, I'd see you, it looks like it didn't leak, so that's good, you're not in there right now. But you have AirDrop, you have access to other photos, you can share them from right here, which is really handy. Great photo sharing option is iCloud photo sharing. I'm gonna tap on that now, let's go into iCloud photo sharing. And from here, I can select the photo streams that I wanna to share to. So I'm on family photos now, but I'm gonna drill in, and I can see other photo streams I've set up and now other people can share into my photo stream as well. So these are shared photo streams. I'll just select a, a photo stream here and uh, type a little message. We'll post that photo. So we've made it really easy to share and we've also made it a really great experience to experience the photos you and others have shared with this new shared tab at the bottom. So I'm gonna go in here, you can see my photo with a comment. I can see the comments of other people and the photos that they've shared. And now we even support sharing video via iCloud photo sharing. And we have a great way to just browse those shared photos. I just tilt the device into landscape. I can scroll through it like this and just look at how beautiful that is. What a great way to experience your photos. So that's the new Photos app in iOS 7. So integration with internet services is a huge part of the experience of iOS and never more so than in iOS 7. So to take you through some of those features, I'd like to bring up EddieQ.
Eddie. Great job, Craig. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here. So let's talk about Siri. The first thing is Siri has a gorgeous new interface. Now as I speak, you'll see a sound wave across the bottom, and you get the results in a beautiful, gorgeous, clean way. But Siri has always been a lot about your, the voice of Siri, and we've got an all-new voice. Hi, Eddie. What can I do for you? And you can also choose a male voice. Hi, Eddie. What can I do for you? And we've got high quality, thank you. <laughs> we've also got high quality female and, and, and male voices for French. En quoi puis-je vous être utile, Eddie? As well as German. Was kann ich für dich tun, Eddie? And we're going to be adding other languages over time. Now, Siri is also getting a lot smarter. It knows how to control more of your device. So you could say, play my last voicemail, or turn on Bluetooth, or increase my brightness. And it can answer a lot more questions, because we've integrated some new services, like Twitter, so you can see what people are saying or what's happening. We've integrated the world's largest encyclopedia in Wikipedia, and we've even integrated web search results from Bing right inside of Siri. And it's great for photos, too. And that's some of the new features of Siri in iOS 7. Now, Siri is also a big part of our next feature, iOS in the car. Now, 95% of the cars being sold today have integrated music playback and control from an iOS device. But we want to take this integration to a whole nother level. What if you could get iOS on the screen that is built into your car so that you can make phone calls, play music, go to maps, get your iMessages right on the screen in your car, or eyes free using Siri? So now, when you make a phone call, it's going to look something like this. Call John Appleseed. Or play Get Lucky. Or go to Maps. Get Directions. Or even get your iMessages read to you, and you can dictate a response all eyes free. Now, all of these car manufacturers are introducing iOS integration in 2014, and I know which one I want to buy. <laughs> and that's iOS in the car. Next, the App Store. Now, the App Store looks beautiful. It's way easier to find apps than ever before. We've added a new feature where you can look for apps based on your age range, kids' categories. Parents are going to love this and apps near me. You can find the most popular apps based on your current location. So now, let's say I'm at AT&T Park in San Francisco, and here are the apps I would see. Or I'm at the Louvre in Paris. Or I'm in Union Square shopping. It's that easy to discover new apps. It's really great. Now, the next feature I know you're all going to love, because every day you see something like this. Well, no more, because the App Store updates your apps automatically. <laughs> Next, let's talk about music. The music app in iOS 7 is beyond a doubt the best music player we have ever done. The first thing you'll notice is we provide you with beautiful artist images right in your library. And you just tap an artist and you see the songs. But it's not just the songs on your device. You see all of your purchased music from iCloud right in your library. And if you want to hear one of the songs, you just tap and you get our beautiful now playing screen. But it's not just your purchased music. In the video apps, you get all of your movies and TV shows right from iCloud, right in your library. It's really, really great.
Now, if you turn the device sideways, you see your albums. You can just swipe to see more, and once you see one you like, you tap and it zooms right in. Now, the music app is the best way to listen to your music. But today, we're introducing an amazing way to discover new music, and we call it iTunes Radio. And here's what it looks like. It's built right into the music app, but rather than tell you about it, I'd love to show it to you. And we'll launch the music app. And the first thing you'll notice is we've got a set of featured stations that our programming team have created. So you can see the songs that are trending on Twitter right now, or even the songs that you guys are all gonna hear this week at WWDC. But I feel like summer songs. So you just tap. And once you have a station you love, you can just tap the eye and you could share it with a friend or even create a new station based on this artist or song. I can easily skip to the, see what's the next song. I'll go back to stations, but it's not just the featured stations that we provide. You can create your own stations. Here are some that I previously created. But I feel like doing something new. Now, our music team is providing you with hundreds of stations based on alternative, country, classic rock, but I feel like doing something a little more specific. How about some Led Zeppelin? with a great Led Zeppelin song. Um, let's go ahead and see what else is on this station. And a great thing is I can always modify the station. I can just tap the star and I can say play more songs like this or never play this song or add it to my wish list. Now I like this so let's play some more songs like this. Now another great feature of iTunes Radio is it keeps track of all of the songs that you're listening to across all the stations all your devices and you can get to them by just tapping history. You can see them all here, you can preview and buy right from there. And that's iTunes Radio. So iTunes Radio is built into iOS 7. It works on your iPhone, your iPod Touch, and your iPad. It's also built into iTunes on your Mac and PC and even in your living room built into Apple TV. <laughs> iTunes Radio is free with ads, and if you're an iTunes Match subscriber, it's completely ad free. <laughs> We're starting in the US, and we'll be adding other countries over time, and that's the new music app on iOS 7, it is the best music player we have ever done. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Eddie. So 10 amazing features in iOS 7 and a comprehensive end-to-end -end UI redesign. And of course, we're bringing it all to iPad as well. Now, there's more to iOS 7 than we had time to talk to you about in depth here today. Things like FaceTime audio, where you now can do audio only, high quality audio calls over Wi-Fi on any <laughs> iOS device. <laughs> notification sync, so if you dismiss a notification on one device, you don't have to deal with it over and over again on your other devices. 
great feature for our users in China with integration of the popular microblogging website site Tencent Weibo. And for those of you who have people who just won't let go, phone, FaceTime, and message blocking. <laughs> also, for our enterprise fee, uh, customers, per app VPN. Now, there's, yeah, there's a couple enterprise people in the audience, all right? So, in addition to all this, there's one feature I want to talk about in a little bit more detail, which is activation lock. So, hundreds of millions of us use Find My iPhone to find our phone when it's just lost in the couch or maybe left at Starbucks, but also when it's been stolen. And now, with activation lock, if a thief tries to turn off Find My iPhone, or if they even wipe the device entirely, they will not be able to reactivate it because they don't know your iCloud username and password. We think this is gonna be a really powerful theft deterrent. Now, of course, in addition to being a great release for our users, iOS 7 is also a fantastic and major release for our developers as well. The SDK includes over 1,500 new APIs, can add AirDrop, integrate with third-party game controllers, new APIs for taking advantage of multitasking, iBeacons for Bluetooth LE microlocation, Sprite Kit for super fast, power efficient game animations, and UI dy dynamics to bring physics to your UI view animations. So I, yeah. So iOS 7 is available to you developers in beta on the iPhone today. We'll have betas for iPad coming up in the, near, in the coming weeks, and for everyone else, a final release coming this fall. So I, iOS 7 will be available for iPhone 4 and later, iPad 2 and later, the iPad mini, and the fifth generation iPod Touch. That is iOS 7. I hope you love it. Thank you. What a morning. You've seen some incredible products. OS X Mavericks, our latest release of the world's most advanced desktop operating system. It's the best OS X yet. The new incredible MacBook Airs with unbelievable battery life, they continue to define the future of the notebooks. The next generation Mac Pro, a revolutionary computer designed especially for our power users. I work for iCloud. Create beautiful documents right in your browser on a Mac or a PC. iOS 7, amazing new features and a stunning new user interface. It's the biggest change to iOS since the introduction of iPhone. And iTunes Radio, the absolute best way to discover new music. We are incredibly proud of all of these products. They're great examples of what Apple does best. I'd like to thank everyone at Apple that worked so hard to create them. I get to work with the most talented and creative people on earth, and it's a joy to serve with them. Thank you. I'd like to close this morning with a reminder that our goal at Apple is to make amazing products that our customers love, really great products that enrich people's lives. The words you saw at the beginning of the show are more than just words to us. They're the values we live by. They drive us. You've seen them reflected in our products over the years and just as much in the products this morning. And you'll continue to see these reflected in the products we do in the future. 
we've created an ad to help us express just how deeply we feel about this, and I'd like to share it with you now. This is it. This is what matters. The experience of a product. How will it make someone feel? Will it make life better? Does it deserve to exist? We spend a lot of time on a few great things until every idea we touch enhances each life it touches. You may rarely look at it, but you'll always feel it. This is our signature, and it means everything. I'm really glad you like that. You'll begin to see it on TV beginning this evening. Those words mean a great deal to us, and I hope they mean a lot to you as well. Have a great conference. Enjoy the week. Thank you. Yeah.